Uh, I prefer gold to silver, you know, for my metal. I figured you'd recommend me for one since I, uh, pulled your boots out of the fire. If we present you with a medal, you'll end up sitting on stage listening to politicians make speeches for a couple of hours. That's a good point. They'd probably make me shave, too. I spent the last seven weeks working on this baby. No medal's worth that. So, Commander, why don't you tell me why you're really here? How's the Normandy performing? Is she everything they said she'd be? She's the best ship in the fleet. If you've got a pilot who knows how to handle her. Balance isn't what you'd expect. Takes a while to get used to that oversized drive core we got stuffed in the back, and her power can sneak up on you if you're not careful. The Normandy's probably too much ship for your average Alliance pilot, Commander. Lucky for you, I'm anything but average. I like to know my crew. Mind if I ask you a few questions? <laughs> I can see where this is going. You did a background check on me, didn't you? Well, I'll tell you the same thing I told the captain. You want me as your pilot. I'm not good. I'm not even great. I am the best damn helmsman in the Alliance fleet. Top of my class in flight school, I earned that. All those commendations in my file, I earned every single one. Those weren't given to me as charity for my disease. What are you talking about? Are you sick? You mean... You mean you didn't know? Oh, crap. Okay, I've got Vrolich syndrome, brittle bone disease. The bones in my legs never develop properly. They're basically hollow, too much force, and they'll shatter. Even with crutches and my leg braces, it's hard to get around. One wrong step and crack! It's very dramatic. But I've learned to manage my condition, Commander. Put the Normandy in my hands and I'll make her dance for you. Just don't ask me to get up and dance unless, you know, you like the sound of snapping shin bones. Why does everyone call you Joker? It's a lot shorter than saying Alliance Flight Lieutenant Jeff Moreau. Plus, I love to make little children laugh. I was just thinking how much you remind me of Santa Claus. Look, I didn't pick the name. One of the instructors in flight school used to bug me about never smiling. She started calling me Joker, mm, and it stuck. Why didn't you ever smile? Hey, I worked my ass off in flight school, Commander. The world's not gonna hand you anything if you go around grinning like an idiot. By the end of the year, I was the best pilot in the academy. Even better than the instructors, and everybody knew it. They'd all got their asses kicked by the sickly kid with the creaky little legs. One guess who was smiling at graduation. I need to know more about this Rolex syndrome if I'm putting my ship in your hands. Yeah, of course you do. It's an extremely rare condition. Nobody knows exactly what causes it. Genetic, maybe. It's treatable, but there's no cure. They classify my case as moderate to severe. I was born with over a dozen fractures. Hip, thighs, ankles, my bones were already breaking in the womb. A hundred years ago, I wouldn't have survived past my first year. Lucky for me, modern medical science has turned me into a productive member of society. You're not gonna break a bone trying to fly the ship, are you? Uh, I don't fly with my feet, Commander, so I'm fine as long as I'm in this chair. I gotta be real careful when I get up to take a piss, though. I can do my job as well as anyone on the ship. Better, actually. So don't worry about it. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. Let's talk about something else. Whatever you want, Commander. I have to go. All right, see ya. If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. I'm in charge here, Presley. I decide if we have non-humans on this vessel. Yes, ma'am. Understood, ma'am. Speak freely, Presley. I want to know if you have a problem with non-humans. It's not that, Commander. Humanity has always handled its own problems. Saren attacked one of our colonies. We should be the ones to stop him. We don't need their help. This is bigger than humanity. Saren's a threat to every species in the galaxy, and I'll welcome anyone who wants to help me bring him down. I guess so. Maybe I'm just stuck in the old ways of thinking. But don't worry, Commander. This won't be a problem. How did you end up assigned to the Normandy? I signed up with the Alliance as a navigator right out of school, following in my grandfather's footsteps, I guess. My first posting was on the Agincourt. We were at Elysium during the Skillian Blitz. A massive fleet of alien raiders hit the colony, trying to wipe it out. They had the numbers, but their ships were no match for an Alliance frigate. It was a slaughter. We couldn't even keep track of how many ships they lost. How'd you end up on the Normandy? I got my officer's commission after Elysium. Must have made an impression on the right people. Captain asked for me when he was picking his crew. 
Carry on, Presley. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Commander? Is there something you need? How did you end up serving on an Alliance ship? I enlisted right out of meds. I wanted to travel the stars. Ten but humanity needs the Alliance if we want to keep expanding through the Traverse. And the Alliance always I should go. Needs. Goodbye, Commander. Commander. Are you coming to check up on me? I just want to talk. Of course. I never properly thanked you for saving me from the Geth, Commander. If you hadn't shown up, I... I had to save you. You can help me stop Saren. I know you took a chance bringing me aboard this ship. I have seen the way your crew looks at me. They do not trust me. But I am not like Benezia. I will do whatever I can to help you stop Saren. I promise. Promises are easy to make, but hard to keep. I do not begrudge you your suspicions. I just hope in time you will come to trust me. Tell me about yourself, Liara. Me? I am afraid I am not very interesting, Commander. I spend most of my time on remote digs, unearthing mundane items buried in long-forgotten Prothean ruins. Hey, you're right. That doesn't sound very interesting. On occasion, I have run afoul of indigenous life forms or stumbled across small bands of privateers. That probably does not seem very exciting to someone like you. I guess seeking out history's lost secrets holds a special appeal for me. I would give a century of my life to discover a beacon like the one you found on Eden Prime. You were actually touched by working Prothean technology. That is why I find you so fascinating, Commander. I'm not some artifact you can take back to your lab, Doctor. I... I am sorry, Commander. I did not mean it like that. I... I just... I am used to dealing with computers and data disks. I am not very good with people. I let my professional curiosity get the better of me. Please forgive me. Let us talk about something else. Do you know why Benezia joined up with Saren? I don't understand it. She was always outspoken about the need for the Asari to become more involved in shaping galactic events. Maybe she thought allying herself with Saren would somehow be for the greater good in the long run. At least I hope so. Any chance she's in this for power or personal gain? No, not the Benezia I knew. But I hadn't spoken with my mother in many years. She may have changed. I'd like to know more about the Asari. We were the first species to discover the Citadel. We were instrumental in forming the Council. And we always strive to be the voice of peaceful cooperation in galactic disputes. My people believe we are all part of a single galactic community. Each species contributes something to the greater whole. Although we seek to understand other species, it seems few of them seek to understand us. The galaxy is filled with rumors and misinformation about my people. Like what? Most of the inaccuracies are centered around our mating rituals. My species is monogendered. Male and female have no real meaning for us. We still require a partner to reproduce. This second parent, however, may be of any species and any gender. I don't understand. Your species can mate with anyone? Mating is not quite the proper term, not as you understand it. Physical contact may or may not be involved, but it is not an essential element of the union. The true connection is mental. Our physiology allows us to meld with other beings. We can touch the very depths of their minds. We explore the genetic memory of their species. We share the most basic elements of their individual and racial identities. We then pass these traits onto our daughters. It is how we learn to grow as a species and how we develop a greater understanding of other races. What happens to your partner after the union? Every relationship is different. Some unions are a single encounter with both parents parting ways afterwards. Others can be more long term. Sometimes an Asari and her partner will stay together for many decades. Do you know who Matriarch Benezia chose as her partner? She rarely spoke of her partner. Though I know my father, if you want to use that term, was another Asari. I thought you always needed another species to serve as one of the parents. 
Think about it, Shepard. If we were not able to mate with our own species, we would have died out long before we ever mastered spaceflight and left our homeworld. Union with our own kind is no longer common, not for the purposes of reproduction. Most Asari believe it weakens our species. Asari daughters inherit racial traits from the father species. If both parents are Asari, then nothing has been gained, or so conventional wisdom would hold. I am what is sometimes called a pure blood. Though no Asari would ever be cruel enough to say the word to my face, it is a great insult among my people. It is possible Benezia's partner was embarrassed by their union. She may have been too ashamed to publicly acknowledge me as her offspring. Why agree to the union if she didn't want any children? I cannot answer that. This is all speculation on my part. It is possible she wanted to be part of my life, but something happened to her before she had the chance. Benezia never spoke of her partner. Whatever happened, it caused her too much pain to dwell on it. She raised me by herself, though that is not uncommon. Many Asari raise their children alone, particularly if the father species is short-lived. Often the partner will pass on long before the child reaches maturity. You Asari live for a thousand years. What happens when your partner dies? Few sapient species live as long as my kind. We have learned to take a philosophical approach to our unions. We do not focus on the inevitable loss of our partners. Instead, we enjoy the time we spend with them. And even after they're gone, a part of them lives on in us. The Union is a connection that transcends both time and space. I should go. Goodbye, Shepard. Commander, do you have a minute? Make it quick, Lieutenant. I have a lot on my mind. This Saren is looking for records on some kind of galactic extinction. But we can't get back up from the Council? Sorry, Commander. There's writing on the wall here, but someone isn't reading it. We've got our orders. Belly aching won't change them. I hear you. It, it just seems like a group that's been around as long as the Council should see this coming. I mean, it's funny, we finally get out here, and the final frontier was already settled. And the residents don't even seem impressed by the view. Or the dangers. Well, well. You're a romantic. Did you sign on for the dream, Malenko? Secure a man's future in space? <laughs> yeah, I, re I read a lot of those books when I was a kid, where the hero goes to space to prove himself worthy of a woman he loves, or... You know, for justice. Maybe I was a romantic in the beginning, but I thought about it after brain camp. Uh, sorry. Biotic acclimation and temperance training. I'm not looking for the dream. I just want to do some good. See what's out here. Sorry if I got too informal. Protocol wasn't a big focus back in BOT. I trust you won't have any questions when whatever's coming hits the fan? None. I'm not questioning the mission. I'm just concerned. Sorry to have wasted your time, ma'am. It won't happen again. Shepard, what can I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. You Krogans live for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. Yeah, they tried the same with us, but we fought them off. It's not the same. Seems similar enough to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand. 
but don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. I was just making conversation. I wasn't trying to upset you. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. So long, Rex. Shepard. Commander? Do you have a few minutes to talk? One-on-one? -on -one? Sure. I, I was hoping to get a minute of your time. Off the record. It's not normal for an enlisted to speak informally with the commander. I figured since the crew was so small, you might be more permissive. I mean, that helmsman of yours. Most places, he'd be at Captain's Mast every day. I, I know things are different aboard the Normandy, but uh, I'm... I'm concerned about the aliens, Vicarian and Rex. With all due respect, Commander, should they have full access to the ship? You don't trust their motives because they're not human. This is the most advanced ship in the Alliance Navy. I don't think we should give them free reign to poke around the vital systems. Engines, sensors, weapons... That's enough, Chief. You always second-guess your superiors? Ma'am, no ma'am. I'm sorry, I was out of line. I'll get back to my duties, Commander. Commander, nice work out there. I knew working with the Spectre would be better than life at CSEC. Have you worked with the Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. At CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. Being a Spectre does have its advantages. Exactly my point. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. CSEC's handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. You did the right thing. Life's too short to sit around waiting for things to happen. Yeah, you're probably right. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without CSEC headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. As long as you do your job well, you're free to go about your business as you see fit. Thank you, Commander. Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian, Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. Ambassador Udina made me take her along. Normally I don't have anything nice to say about politicians, but he made a good call on this. 
However, I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth system. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. Where else have you served, Adams? If you name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo. Only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on. Probably the fastest vessel ever designed. And she's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype, cutting edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. 
It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. You had to know it would blow up in your face. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. So there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But, when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. That doesn't make any sense. I'm probably oversimplifying. The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian Overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. What did you do? It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. You didn't really think they'd just let you destroy them without a fight, did you? The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Vale. Now, we drift through space, exile searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. You got what you deserved. We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place. But we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? They didn't kill Saren. 
What does that tell you? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. They want to destroy us. Not just the Quarians. All organic life. That's why they've joined up with Saren. And that's why we have to stop him. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I want to talk about something else. Like what? I should go. I...